Hi, and welcome to uh, our third lecture on cognitive neuroscience. Uh, in our last lecture, we talked about structures and functions of neurons. And in this lecture, we are going to take a look at the resting membrane potential in more detail. This is a really important cellular process and a lot of detail involved here. In this lecture and the next lecture on the action potential, we're going to uh, spend quite a bit of time uh, talking about uh, how ions move back and forth across the membrane. For those of you who've taken biology, this is very similar to having to learn the Krebs cycle. So there's a lot of detail. Um, so we're going to go through this in a couple different lectures. I've broken this up into kind of smaller pieces, and hopefully that will make this a little bit easier to get down. So uh, let's start with an introduction to neuronal signaling, and we'll talk then about the membrane potential and then the action potential itself. So again, this is a really important part of understanding uh, neuroscience. So first off, neurons receive and transmit information via what we call neuronal signaling. So within a neuron, signals travel from input synapses primarily on the dendrites and cell body to output synapses on the axon terminal. So what happens is neurotransmitters for most uh, synapses uh, bind with the postsynaptic neuron on the dendrite and dendritic spines and the cell body. Those then alter the electrochemical properties of the cellular membrane. And should they alter it sufficiently, they can then generate uh, a single electrical signal which travels the full axon down to the axon terminal, causing the release of neurotransmitters. And then that signal moves on to the next neuron. So these synapses output, to information, output information to other neurons um, or targets, such as muscles, blood vessels, glands, organs, etc. So, uh, for example, if you go to reach out and grab your coffee, like I'm about to, uh, you will uh, use a neuron that will fire and cause uh, muscle fibers to contract and release, uh, and those will be calibrated by um, sensory um, neurons in your uh, hand and arms. So all of this uh, occurs via those targets, such as muscles, but also coming from those uh, sensory systems and back to the brain. So uh, these occur uh, throughout the body, and that's how we really do everything, is by this process. So between neurons, information is transmitted mostly via chemical messengers, which are neurotransmitters. We'll talk about neurotransmitters and neurotransmitter systems in a couple of upcoming lectures. Uh, there are some neurons that are connected via electrical synapses, and we'll um, briefly visit uh, that issue um, and talk about how that's important. This usually occurs for very rapid information, um, but for the most part, most uh, information is transmitted via neurotransmitters across the synapse. So let's talk about then uh, this resting membrane potential we introduced, I introduced in the last lecture. So the membrane potential is an electrical difference between the inside and the outside of the cell. We'll talk about how electrical and concentration gradients uh, influence this process, and we'll talk about ion channels, and then we'll finish up uh, this section uh, talking about ion pumps. So the resting membrane potential across the membrane at rest is negative 70 millivolts, which means the inside of the cell is negative 70 millivolts compared to the outside. So remember, this is a membrane potential and an electrical potential. It's much like a battery. Um, so batteries have a, a, an electrical potential as well. Uh, so remember, it's stored energy whenever we have an electrical potential. And this is maintained by uh, both passive and active processes. So there are a number of ions that are contained inside and outside the cell. Outside the cell is primarily sodium and chloride, which uh, sodium is a positive ion, chloride is a negative ion. It's one of the reasons why salt is important for life. Um, and then inside the cell is primarily potassium ions. And so those potassium ions um, are brought into the neuron via the sodium potassium pump and sodium ions are tossed out by that same process. So we toss out three sodium ions and bring in two potassium ions for every cycle of the sodium potassium pump. And each of those, those then consumes a single ATP molecule as well. So as I said, this is very much like the Krebs cycle. In fact, it's directly connected to the Krebs cycle via the production of ATP. Remember the Krebs cycle um, creates uh, adenosine triphosphate, um, which is the primary sort of energy source um, throughout the body. 
So one of the things that happens uh, throughout this process are both electrical and concentration gradients. Concentration gradients work to move ions from areas of higher concentration to lower concentration. So this works anytime you like try to dissolve, say if you put salt in water, eventually if you sort of let it sit there for long enough, those salt ions will um, equally distribute throughout uh, a fluid. So you should, might remember this from um, chemistry. So, uh, so ions sort of repel one another. So they try to um, uh, basically equally distribute themselves throughout. And so when we have a higher concentration compared to a lower concentration, ions are trying to move from areas of high concentration to low concentration. So these concentration gradients push sodium ions from outside the cell to inside the cell. So there's more sodium ions outside than inside. So this concentration gradient is trying to push sodium ions in. Um, at the same time, that concentration gradient is trying to push potassium ions from inside to outside the cell. Now, sodium ions don't uh, leak in and out of the cell, but potassium ions do. And so they kind of get pushed in and out um, by concentration and electrical gradients. And we maintain that, those levels, uh, via the sodium-potassium pump. So electrical gradients are a second physical force that are trying to draw potassium ions into the cell. And so uh, because the inside of the cell is more negative, and these are positive ions, those, remember, positive and negative ions attract one another. And so those potassium ions are being attracted or pushed into the cell. Uh, and eventually, those potassium ions reach what we call electrochemical equilibrium. Uh, that is, the concentration gradient and the electrical gradient are pushing against one another at about the same force. And so uh, nothing really moves. Uh, we maintain the entire... Uh, electrical potential by that sodium potassium pump. So that gets us then to ion channels. Um, neurons have a selectively for permeable ion channels for potassium, sodium, and calcium. Calcium becomes more important when we get down to the terminal buttons. Uh, the uh, voltage gated calcium channels open and those calcium ions come into the cell and cause vesicles to fuse with the cellular membrane, thereby releasing their neurotransmitters. For electrical signaling, we're mostly concerned with potassium and sodium ions, as well as chloride ions a little bit. So there are many more um, potassium channels um, than sodium channels, so that results in greater potassium ion concentration. These are gated ion channels. Uh, they open and close in response to electrical or chemical stimulation. Primarily, these are voltage-gated ion channels. So when the membrane is at rest, the sodium channels are closed, and the potassium channels are partially closed, but we get some leakage of, pa of potassium in and out of the cell. And so these concentration gradients, both electrical, and, or electrical gradients and concentration gradients, um, sort of help maintain that potassium uh, equilibrium in addition to the sodium-potassium pump. So here we have these ion pores um, where sodium might be entering, potassium might be exiting, coming in, coming out. So they are coming through via these channels uh, through that phospholipid bilayer. So uh, here we have, uh, again, another uh, sort of view of this process where we have potassium ions uh, curve leaking out. We have a sodium channel. Um, as well, and then we also have the pota sodium potassium pump where you can see three sodium ions are being removed and two potassium ions are being moved in. So that gets us to that ion pump. So normally sodium and chloride concentrations are greater outside, while potassium are greater inside despite those concentration on electrical gradients. And the sodium potassium pump is responsible for that. It's this active transport protein which pumps three sodium ions out of the cell while drawing two potassium ions into the cell. And so what's happening is this process, process is constantly maintaining that um, charge across the membrane. And each cycle of that sodium-potassium pump consumes uh, a molecule of ATP. So every time we run that pump, and for every pump, we have to have uh, a molecule of ATP. So neurons, um, because this process is constant, um, and the sodium potassium pump actually really works hard after a neuron fires, your brain uses a lot of ATP. And that's one of the reasons why oftentimes we will uh, look at where the brain is using glucose, because remember glucose is an important part of the Krebs cycle. And so a um, lot of energy being consumed uh, throughout the brain by the, by the sodium potassium pumps.
So again, another look at this. Summary of these processes that are maintaining the resting potential. We have ion channels. We have different distributions of ions. We have the sodium potassium pump. And of course we have concentration gradients and electrical gradients. So potassium's leaving the cell because of the concentration gradient. Potassium's entering the cell because of the electrical gradient. So that's a quick summary of uh, the membrane potential. In our next lecture, we're gonna talk about the generation of an action potential by these processes.